Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the SPICE uh, webinar on uh, uh, common buyer groups and joint procurement. Um, my name is Bahar uh, Namaki Aragi. I'm uh, the project coordinator for the EU project called SPICE, uh, which the abbreviation is a Smart Procurement for Better Transport. Next, please. I'm going to first briefly uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the SPICE project background and uh, you know, what the project uh, is about, and then uh, also go through the program for today and then give you a hand on our uh, speakers for, for the rest of the day. Um, the SPICE project is basically, if you focus on the figure on the right-hand side of the slide, um, basically we have three main pillars in the SPICE project. The first. Uh, core for the SPICE project is about uh, stakeholders and uh, we have been trying to create a very broad uh, stakeholder group including public procurers, industry suppliers and also the research community. And the whole uh, perspective in the SPICE project was that to get involved with the real uh, partners and users in this project to gain experiences about innovative procurement and also to gain experience across the whole uh, variety of possibilities within the innovation and innovative procurement, uh, including competitive dialogue, uh, competitive procedures, negotiations, and also partnerships uh, within uh, the SPICE project. Um, we have started about uh, a year and a half ago, uh, and we are almost uh, towards the last quarter of the project. Um, the SPICE should finish by the end of the August this year, and we have been running a lot of different activities uh, over the last uh, one and a half year. Um, the whole perspective in the SPICE project has been that we get involved with our stakeholder group and trying to collect a lot of best practices within the procurement of ITS, mobility services, electrical vehicle, and also uh, focus on the policy trends uh, within the European countries. And we have been trying to analyze both in terms of the legal perspective and also technical aspects of this project and try to come up with some uh, recommendations for the mainly public authorities that are going to procure a lot more innovative projects in the next coming years. And as not surprising, this is usually a huge investment with uh, also innovation, which means there is a lot of learning uh, that how we should actually use the European directive to implement these learnings and also um, mitigate the risks and also have a better uh, possibility to get to the solutions that you are really aiming for. And uh, by the end of the project, we are expecting to give some recommendations uh, on each specific topic, uh, as I mentioned, electrical vehicle and also ITS and also mobility services uh, for, for each topic to our public uh, authorities. Um, the best practices uh, has been already collected across Europe in all different topics uh, and also they are available in our website if you would like to have them. And we have been trying to do also a couple of capacity buildings um, by, by similar webinars, workshops and so on. And uh, the next step for us would be to start creating some common buyer groups, uh, which is quite of interest right now. And we could see that uh, the bigger the projects and the more complexity is actually uh, the joint procurement is getting more and more interesting and more and more uh, a good way of collaboration. So that's why today uh, we have uh, invited a couple of uh, experts that you will listen to them later on and then we will go deeper into the common uh, buyer group. Um, can you show the next slide please? Um, basically, uh, we have been looking at many different approaches for procurement uh, over the size project, but uh, one of the uh, also milestones for us has been to see that what are the possibilities we enjoyed procurement and also what are the challenges that people could expect to have. And um, one of the objectives of today's webinar is that uh, we would like to tell you that we are actually very interested to start collecting information from you in case you are working on some common uh, procurement or you already have some experiences with that earlier and also we would like to try also to um, discuss about uh, and help uh, also gaining the experiences about the benefits challenges where can we actually join procurement and what are the possibilities within this uh, framework and also how we as a size project can actually offer you support and also um, sort of um, basically we as a project are very 
very much willing to, to come to a relationship with their existing common procurement or upcoming procurement and share our expertise. And also um, there are some upcoming um, events that with the focus on this aspect that we would like to know if you are interested, you're very welcome to contact us also by the end of the project. But what we can as a SPICE project basically try to offer for uh, those who are in this um, uh, webinar and also are focused on common buyer groups in general is that we would like to try to give them the access to the information we have and also we try to give them also some support um, both in terms of the technical and legal aspects if this is within the scope of expertise we have and also uh, we would try to share their information Information with our broader network of stakeholders and also we will have um, a couple of workshops coming in the near future that uh, we would like to invite some experts and get the get their uh, input and also experiences involved into this project and it's also about uh, creating a good platform for capacity building and sharing the experiences and knowledge from both sides uh, and hopefully facilitate this path for the upcoming um, procurement and also upcoming uh, new cities and new authorities that are joining this approach for common procurement. Next please. Um, the program for today will be that I will um, finish very shortly and I will give the floor to um, our uh, WP4 leader, Mr. Sebe Vogel from uh, Ministry of Road and Transportation um, of Netherlands, Rex Schwarzstadt. Uh, he will tell you about a, sort of different models uh, and forms of common procurement that we have been trying to analyze within the SPICE project. And then uh, later on, uh, I will uh, give the floor to our external uh, guest, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Eduardo Flecci, uh, which will uh, talk about floating car data and great experiences of the Netherlands uh, National Data Warehouse and how they have been uh, trying to create a setup for common procurement of floating car data and also um, afterwards uh, the common procurement initiation uh, of the Netherlands uh, government for the intelligent traffic light by Mr. Uh, Forkel Blombergen. Um, and at the end, there will be some time for everybody to raise hand and ask questions, and we will be very happy to, to answer the questions. Um, and also, very short wrap up by the end of the, uh, the hour. And I wish you all enjoy, uh, and uh, we can actually share some good knowledge with you today uh, in this webinar. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Saber Vogel speaking. Um, I will give you a short introduction on common buyer groups uh, and the work that we did uh, until now and what SPICE can op offer for common buyer groups uh, uh, in uh, yeah, helping them. Please, next slide. Uh, I just put a little picture of me because uh, otherwise uh, that gives a face uh, to the to this uh, voice you are hearing. Uh, you can always uh, get in contact uh, to me by this or through the SPICE website, of course. Please, next. So, um, yeah, in the work package about common buyer groups we already worked on uh, best practices in common buyer uh, of in common procurements uh, this version is also available from the website um, and just give you a little insight in what is uh, what is common procurement um, so common procurement is, uh, is a procurement of cooperation from two or more authorities in the procurement process uh, within spice we focus with uh, on common procurement, but especially in innovation solutions in the field of transport and mobility. Uh, so we're not doing it on everything, but we try to focus on uh, specific uh, aspects of it. Next, please. In the document, uh, best practices, uh, you can also find that we identified um, uh, on based on interviews, desk research and, uh, and partner experience. Uh, uh, four different types of cooperation in procurement that, that can be identified and here you see some pictures schematically how this uh, how this works um, uh, for example joint procurement um, so you have common elements that you share uh, but actually uh, every tender team is 
the, is, is creating their own uh, documents but to share information uh, together. Uh, uh, you have partial uh, common procurement. Um, sorry, I think uh, there's a little mistake in the picture. Um, now, joint procurement actually is the, uh, the right upper thing, and the partial common procurement is the, um, the left upper thing. I see that there is a little mix up between them. Um, joint procure actually rarely exists, and um, for example, there's many reasons. Um, there is, is, for example, there are differences in the procurement uh, regional legislation, for example. Uh, practice of uh, procuring entities, uh, different technical solutions needed. Uh, so that's why really joint procurement where you get from uh, working together with different authorities and in different countries to one tender document doesn't really happen very often. Um, two other things that you uh, see is procurement by a central purchasing bo body. Um, then there's sort of a central organization that will arrange a common procurement for different procurers or procuring teams or, or bodies that, that would like to share it and they uh, invite a common, uh, they, they build a common organization to do it for them. And in some places you can see that they're, that's the right bottom one uh, based on common specifications. So a central organization helps to uh, write specifications or attend the documents or uh, uh, format that will be used by the procurers uh, of the different organizations and they use it to uh, finalize their tender documents uh, further down the line. Uh, next please. Um, so on these uh, aspects, uh, different forms you can find really more elaboration in the, in the document uh, from the work package 3.1, so the best practices. Is, there's elaborated more on what are the pre's and cons. Um, or just to give you an idea of, of issues that you might face uh, uh, within these, uh, these uh, common buyer groups is that a different perspective of the solution that are needed. You have to overcome that. Um, what we often find is practical issues, uh, legal differences, um, uh, influences of joint procurement in relation to the market. Uh, sometimes we hear that uh, that because of cooperation, um, you might find uh, uh, combined procure procurement in a too big order, so that. Uh, you have a position that is not really nice for the, the market. Um, some other things are time consuming, complexity. Um, another thing that we heard further also in workshops in, uh, in uh, Toulouse last year is that there may be sometimes difficulties in uh, how do you select uh, a common uh, uh, together uh, a supplier in the end. Um, and some confidentiality and uh, confidential information during the process. And these are known issues, but of course you can imagine that from uh, working together there, there will be also, on the other hand, uh, also a lot of uh, uh, things that you, uh, you can gain from uh, working together. Uh, in some part you can join uh, on technical specifications and, uh, and save, save time and uh, and save money for, for doing it together. Um, next, please. Um, then I surely I will put it, this slide is my last slide also at the end of the presentation. So what um, are the benefits for uh, working together with SPICE on uh, this subject? And uh, if you are preparing a common buyer group or uh, uh, if you are in a common buyer group and you want to know uh, more of the experience throughout uh, Europe about this, um, then you can uh, uh, can receive support from SPICE. Um, what we do is uh, learn from each other experiences. That's why we are here in this uh, uh, here today. Um, that's why uh, colleagues uh, will explain from from their case what uh, why what are they they are doing and what they gain from it and what are the issues that they face. 
um, team up, peer-to-peer uh, -peer support, of course, um, share information of so best practices. So the report, what I already told you about, is available on the website uh, of SPICE. Um, of course, uh, ideas and recommendation, other technical or le legal supports uh, that will help you. Um, um, and of course, we are open to suggestions of what is needed from common buyer groups that they say SPICE would help us um, uh, figure that out. So if you have an idea or you are a common buyer group already existing, uh, please feel free to contact uh, us um, if we can uh, support you with this. Um, Bahar already mentioned that there will be workshops, uh, uh, I think in May. Um, we are at this moment thinking about um, uh, sort of peer-to-peer -peer support to get involved a couple of um, uh, common bike groups specific on, uh, for example, traffic lights, floating car data, or public transportation. And um, so you can learn from each other and from the experience that are already collected within SPICE. Uh, that will be in Hamburg. Um, that was it, and I now will uh, make the room for Eduardo Felici, please. Thank you. Yes, hello everyone. Eduardo Felici speaking from uh, the National Data Warehouse for Traffic Information. Um, I will tell you something about the joint procurement we did on floating car data um, two years ago. And we had a very uh, successful project by doing a national implementation of floating car data. Let's see. Yes. So for those of you who don't know uh, NDW, of 19 road authorities, uh, comprised of uh, Ex-Waadstad, the National Road Authority, two uh, regional road authorities, the 12 provinces of the Netherlands, and the four main cities. And about 10 years ago, they got together and decided to create one organization um, to um, organize the, the, the data procurement, collection, and distribution. So we are basically a shared service organization for these 19 road authorities, uh, dealing with uh, basically common buyer groups, procurement, um, of traffic data and we are an open data portal and national access point for traffic data from these 19 world authorities and our goal is to make data available for traffic management traffic information and policy analysis for anyone who needs it so in about 10 years we created a network of roadside equipment of about 8,000 kilometers um, between national highways provincial road and city roads and we saw that in the beginning, uh, one of the goals of NDW was to um, fill in the blank spots which were um, present between different areas uh, so we could have national coverage of traffic data. So we procured three main lots, which you can see here in the in blue circles, three geographical lots with which we um, uh, managed to sort of fill in a, a na nationwide coverage of roadside equipment. And we did this in 2009 and 2011, and the goal there was to collect all kinds of data within one lot, and the supplier could only win two of the three lots. So this is what it looked like on our screens. We had a lot of traffic data coming in, a lot of roadside equipment being placed, or very expensive uh, to procure and to maintain. So what we saw happening in the past few years was a transition our data, where you see the classic um, um, means of data collection being Bluetooth, cameras, infrared, and induction loops, to floating data, where you see data from mobile sources being collected without the use of roadside equipment. So we saw great potential in floating car data, uh, things like uh, being able to collect travel times and speeds, uh, origin destination information, activation of traffic management plans, bicycle movements, incident detection, and, and many more things. So uh, since we saw this good, great potential, we decided to tender it in 2016 following a number of pilots, which I'll let you know, and I'll, I'll talk about later. And the procurement question was actually very simple. On behalf of one of the provinces, uh, one of the partners of NEW, can we use the floating car data to um, calculate travel times to show on the variable, variable message signs to detect uh, and, and to detect unexpected congestion? So the tender was won by a Belgian company called B-Mobile, and they use uh, the Flitzmeister app as one of their main sources for data. 
Uh, they offer, offer us national coverage in one go, so we, uh, we receive data from all the highways, all the provincial roads and major city roads. And what we get from B-Mobile is uh, the average speed every 60 seconds up to the past minute, which is delivered on segments of a maximum of 50 meters. So you have to imagine that the whole country is divided up into about 9 million segments, and these 9 million segments offer us the opportunity to uh, calculate uh, travel times, for instance, on uh, stretches of road which our partners request. So what you see here is the map of the Netherlands with uh, the travel times which have been requested by our partners. So these travel times are calculated based on the 50 meter segments which are offered to us by the mobile. And we also do that to avoid uh, a vendor lock-in, uh, which would mean um, that we would have to go back to B-Mobile every time we would need a new travel time or some new information. So now we have a set of data with the 50 meter segments on the basis of which we can calculate our own travel times and offer these to our partners. So this gave us the opportunity to, to expand the national coverage in one go uh, and, and uh, use the same type of technology, the same type of, type of data acquisition for the whole country where before you would have uh, cameras and Bluetooth and infrared uh, on, on different parts of the road and to, to have to add these travel times up would be very problematic. And you can see the granularity of the data where uh, even in the cities like Amsterdam, uh, you can get on, on the major roads, very good quality data. So what we did to procure this, we um, have a framework agreement, which we started in 2013 where we wanted to group together uh, all the major players uh, dealing with data collection in the Netherlands. So we have 14 private companies, part of this um, framework agreement. And the goal was to uh, place every procurement within this framework agreement with these 14 partners. And you can see the overview of all the procurement we've done within the framework agreement since, uh, since then. Um, this is just to show you the overview. We have about 28, I think 30, 30 procurements uh, projects done in the last three to four years um, and many have been done on behalf of one of the partners but uh, some have also been done on behalf of multiple partners so uh, where NDW really acts as a as a uh, com common procurement organization for multiple partners. So how does the framework agreement works? Um, we actually asked two eligibility criteria which were really really low-key very easy to fulfill the only thing a, a company had to have experience with was to create, manage, and maintain systems for the time-critical processing of data for traffic management processes. So quite a quite broad uh, definition. And have experience in the real-time and acquisition of validation and supply of road traffic data on behalf of third parties. So they need to have one or more external clients to determine the nature and extent of the road traffic data. This was the only two, two uh, criteria which they had to oblige to to enter our framework agreement. And then they had to comply to an, a set of documentation, which would obviously say something about um, uh, what kind of work they had to do, uh, the specifications for the chain uh, uh, and for the interfaces, which they had to uh, uh, agree with. And the framework agreement, we decided we could open up periodically. So every one, one or two years to let new companies in, in case of uh, new players on the market or new technology becoming popular. We actually did this once uh, about a year and a half after starting the framework agreement in 2014 and we let three new companies in the framework agreement. So uh, how it works very quickly within the within the framework agreement we send out a request for proposal which uh, had, contains all the major details on uh, what the work is about um, and we ask that their proposals contain a very standardized format of replies this is what we do for which we, how, we've, how we've done most of the procurement. So um, a form saying they agree to all the specifications, uh, they give us their proposed sum and the, the three tabs saying the proposal, the explanation of the proposal, the implementation plan and the maintenance plan are quite standardized. So we are capable as a uh, procurement organization to organize procurements quickly. And because we work within the framework agreement, um, we uh, don't have to adhere to the uh, procurement rules because we've already had the European procurement process done so we can be a lot quicker uh, in procurement and then we have a, a commission that judges the work uh, which has been uh, done in the proposals through tab from, in tab three to five and um, the lowest proposed sum receives an intention to awards after the evaluation is done we have a formal complaint process of about 10 days 
uh, which um, isn't uh, obligatory, as in we, we could have also made that shorter, but we found that 10 days was a good uh, term to uh, let companies uh, you know, um, have a chance to complain in case in case something was wrong. Actually, this has never happened in the, in the five years we've had a framework agreement. Um, and then the definitive warning of the contract. So just to give you an idea how we came to the floating car data procurement, uh, which we did in 2016. Um, in 2013, our organization was facing some new um, challenges as we were asked by our partners to reduce the cost of data procurement by 15%. So we, were, we had about 10 million euros a year of expenditure on data procurement. Um, many road authorities uh, felt pressured to reduce the amount of physical infrastructure along the road um, and there was obviously high interest in using ITS related technologies and since uh, some of the equipment was nearing the end of its lifetime uh, it would require high investments to replace all this measurement infrastructure. So we had to look at a new way to start um, collecting data on a nationwide scale and we came up with this strategy which and uh, divided uh, our, our procurement future in three main lots. So the first main lot, the blue, the blue square, um, was a lot which we decided to use to continue the, um, the, the, the measurement equipment we already had, which was still functioning well. We had uh, quite some equipment which had been placed three to five years before, was still functioning and was not, not yet, had not yet reached the end of its lifetime. So it was um, a good case to continue using this uh, roadside equipment which had been uh, placed for at least three years. So we had a period of at least uh, from 2015 to 2018, uh, actually the, it, it, it ends right now in this quarter, where we wanted to continue using the uh, roadside equipment which we already had as much as possible or as long as possible. And to use this period of three years, to build up two new main lots, so the main lot number two and main lot number three, where in main lot number two, we would uh, try to create a basic network of roadside equipment, um, but to have it on a, on a minimum basic level. So they would, that would mean that we would place roadside equipment only where it is needed um, and try to do everything else we can do with floating, we, we want to do with floating car data, data fusion in main lot three. We found out that we have uh, legislation which we have to uh, oblige to, which asks for roadside equipment to be used. So um, we wanted to make this basic network of volumes and create this main lot number three to procure floating car data on top of that. Um, this is kind of what, what I just explained. So main lot one was the current, the continuation of the current equipment. Um, and to, uh, this was the goal was to facilitate the transition phase to main lots two and three. And it was a geographically divided lot, uh, as you saw in one of my previous slides. Uh, the second lot has to do with this basic network of traffic volumes uh, to comply to regulations related to air and sound pollution. Um, and the idea was to reach completion in a maximum of three years. That's actually being deployed as we speak. Uh, so we started uh, three years ago with the tender process and the deployment process for this. And this is now replacing the current network of main lot one. And the main lot three was the uh, floating car data lots, uh, which we uh, procured in 2016. And we decided also that there, because of the many potential uses of floating car data, we could have a look at many more uses of floating car data. So before we actually went to the final procurement in 2016, we did a lot of pilots because we learned that as a partner organization, uh, which NEW is, we needed to uh, build up expertise, first of all, but also um, let our partners in on the knowledge we gained and, and uh, sort of guide them through to the final procurement. So we started in 2013 with trials, a pilot in 2014 with data fusion, some trial supplies uh, of data in 2015, until eventually in 2016, we learned enough to uh, set up um, procurement criteria so we could actually do the national procurement in 2016. And the national coverage, which then expanded in 2017, as I showed you before. So the goal now is to continue doing this also with pro vehicle data. And um, I'll actually uh, skip through this because the idea is to do the same thing, but then with data coming from the vehicles. So we're learning through pilots how we can start using data from vehicles 
on behalf of all the partners, all the road authorities in the Netherlands, and to do one procurement process on behalf of these 19 road authorities to gain access to this kind of data and to use it for different uh, use cases, for uh, weather alerts, uh, fog and rain alerts, to alert slippery roads, to actually improve information on slippery roads and um, things like, due to asphalt quality or oil spills, thanks to these kind of sensors. Um, for asset management, so to give warnings on potholes and improve asphalt maintenance strategies. And uh, for incident management, so to learn more, to actually be, be able to respond quicker to what's happening out on the road um, and as a road authority to improve and uh, make our processes more efficient. So uh, we did a trial with 20 vehicles, which we deployed with a canvas reader to start learning as a first step to start learning how to get how to use this data uh, to learn what kind of results we see. And the next step would be to get more vehicles to uh, start going sort of going towards a shared procurement of this kind of data. Um, I'll skip through this because uh, this is very specifically dealing with the trial. Um, we're going to continue this trial with uh, more, more uh, vehicles, with more analysis opportunities, and also linking it to the European developments which are being spoken about in the data task force. And the FD experiments uh, we're doing in the Netherlands, we have grouped together under an umbrella program called Innovating with Floating Car Data with a number of partners. And we host an FCD forum where we discuss results of projects uh, three to four times a year. And we share experiences and we group everything together in this slide, which shows uh, 17 projects or ideas we have about how to work with floating car data. And this is the kind of use cases we see uh, which, which we want to start experimenting with or some have already, are already being piloted. Right? In, in any case, uh, we want to start working with to implement floating car data on a on a national scale um, for all the road authorities involved in NDW. Thank you very much. This was uh, everything for me. If you have any questions, you can email me at the uh, email address on the screen. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Volkert uh, Bloembergen and I'm going to talk you through about the Talking tra Traffic Partnership. My presentation will basically consist of two parts. First, I will give a short introduction on the national uh, policy regarding uh, CITS and the introduction of ITS in our country. And then secondly, I will go through the actual project and uh, the tendering procedure which we ran through regarding traffic uh, lights. Um, well, today challenges, huge uh, technology uh, push, uh, much more traffic uh, is going on and at the same time there are also social changes these days. We need basically new solutions and here in the Netherlands we focused on four main areas. First of all, the introduction of autom automated driving. Uh, secondly, connected, uh, cars get connected these days. And of course, thirdly, sharing. Not buying, but sharing is also an important transition which is taking place. And last but not least, of course, the electrification of uh, uh, traffic and uh, transport in general. Today, I will focus more on the connected uh, part of uh, the what we see worldwide is, is a, a, a large focus on, on cities and uh, the key economic areas. And here in the Netherlands, it's, it's no difference. So we focus a lot of our development on these specific uh, 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 areas. I will just skip some of my slides. I've just introduced them so you can get a more, little bit more background uh, if you uh, go through the slides yourself. I will now make a switch towards the innovation partnership, which I will be talking about. That's called Talking uh, Traffic. Um, as you can see on the, on the map, it's about working together, just like the presentation uh, of Mr. Eduardo Felici, 
many regions who take the take up the challenge to work together and have one tendering procedure uh, uh, to innovate on the area of uh, uh, traffic lights in this particular case to make it smarter cheaper and safer and to me that is one big step in order to get a change if you work together as public public uh, uh, parties you get a uh, a bigger tender procedure and you will get different parties on board uh, and you will get a different marketplace uh, for yourself so that's one key lesson for me is uh, uh, work together on the on the public side in this particular case i will give you some background uh, as to what we're doing here in this in this uh, partnership it's basically about creating a cloud-based solution and uh, regarding the exchange of information between public on one side and the motorists uh, on the other side and we use private parties in order to make the chain uh, complete um, of course there's a important technical side of it but there's also a total different side of it regarding for instance privacy and security and legal uh, aspects in this particular case i will focus more of course on the tendering procedure uh, of of the uh, actual talking traffic uh, so creating an open ecosystem basically creating the internet of traffic uh, through telecom uh, uh, in order to reach motorists uh, with better information and more individual information for their journey across and we use um, telecom in this case uh, 4g towards it all our solution is geared towards six use cases of which are the majority is around uh, traffic lights and of course we go for the day one services like, like vehicle signs and speed advice uh, and real-time information on the dangerous situation and rope, road work warnings so there are many different sorts of data involved but the part i'm talking here about is specifically about uh, uh, traffic lights so basically the, the the partnership is much broader uh, in this particular case just to give you a short background of course you will have many sorts of data which you see the small dots around there on which on the on the bottom you find a small sign of a of a traffic light and in the middle you see cluster to cloud service that's a one important point all data is gathered there <coughs> is merged and enriched with private data in order to create these information services which are in the end delivered to the motorists. Eduardo gave a presentation about MDW. MDW of course is the access point from public data into the cloud and finally uh, onto the uh, motorist. What we're trying to do here is a creating a chain of events uh, which is below one second in order that you get real actual information uh, uh, here. So that's a big challenge also in the uh, traffic light uh, procurement, uh, which I'm going to explain to you. So what we did, what we did. We used uh, the new tendering procedure uh, called uh, partnership. And the main change is, of course, we all know PCP as a tendering pr procedure. But in that particular case, a service which has de been developed within that procedure needs to be tendered uh, once it is delivered. And the partnership, it, you can ask for development of an innovative service and exploration in one procedure. That particular procedure was introduced by the, the EU 
because of uh, experiences with the PCP process. What we did, as I told you before, we did it together with the public partners. So we got a scope of 1000 plus uh, traffic lights installation across the country, which were put into the uh, tendering procedure. And just for your information here in the Netherlands, we have about 5,500 traffic lights installations. So 20% of the total was included in the, in the tendering procedure. And again, it was all about the product development. So making sure these traffic lights would be suitable to exchange uh, data in a very uh, fast way, below one second. And at the same time, after the development, have a rollout phase where the, the these data is actually or is actually delivered out of these traffic lights to the to the cloud. The tendering process consisted of first of all a, cons a consultation uh, phase, which was fo then followed by a selection phase with price and and quality, and that's how we in the end uh, uh, got parties uh, selected. So what do you get then in this particular case? First of all, you get a shared investment and a shared risk because that's really what we've done. Because the, in the end, what you need is, is, is working together to get that chain of events, that chain of data delivering uh, worker. Just bringing public and private interest together. The private side from their business case opportunity and the public side getting more, more safety uh, on the road. Another important goal was to extend the marketplace um, by introducing a common architecture with defined exchange points and therefore making a more modular system so it would be possible to have different parties uh, involved and maybe get also new players on that particular market which until now has been rather closed. So that's an important uh, uh, part of the whole procedure and at the same time also in trying to work towards more service orientated approach whereby the actual um, yeah you actually work with services which are based in the cloud rather than in uh, on the roadside equipment which we have today Another important point is that we want to have an open partnership so you can join the partnership. But of course, from a legal perspective, you cannot benefit from public investment because that's, of course, um, uh, yeah, involved with the actual legal procedure, uh, tendering procedure, which we uh, uh, went through. So where, where are we just now? We, we have successfully run the tendering procedure and we're just now at the at the end of the development phase and the first traffic lights have already been connected and uh, shortly the first in-car information servers are about to be rolled out uh, in the next few months but you can also say that making the innovation leap together remains a challenge. Um, you, with the partnership, you in the end have several parties working toward one chain of data exchange and making sure that everybody makes the innovation leap in that particular chain remains a challenge and making sure you get the right focus. To me, the consultation round was key to shaping the tender, making sure that the private parties could share their, their business case and their needs before you go into formal uh, tender procedure. And they actually had a big influence in the way they sh we shaped the actual tender. Another important point to mention is that the new procedure of course, was also new for our purchasing and legal departments within the public authorities. 
that remains a challenge to making sure that everybody involved um, takes part in the transition which takes place as a result of introducing such a new procedure. Another important point here is um, that as a public party, yeah, we are involved in one side working with investment budgets and otherwise with maintenance budgets. But here in the partnership, they come together. That, that was also a challenge for the uh, parties on the public side uh, uh, involved. But in the end, what do you get? You get, you will get mutual gains. You will get social benefits uh, in reduced travel times and especially more road safety and uh, less emission. Consumer be benefits in, 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 in that it's safer and cheaper and it's also sometimes just fun. And private benefits in cost reduction, increased sustainability, but also new business models which come forward out of these uh, tendering procedures. And cities, of course, get an in, in increased uh, urban uh, livability. Uh, so connecting the dots means connecting data and, and, and stakeholders. So what is finally the Dutch approach? Public and private co-investment in order to get real changes in the way you work. <coughs> um, willingness to just do it is also, I think, a, a key uh, to, to the success of the, of the, of the program. Um, it's new, it's new to everyone, but with just do it, you will, you will, you will make a success of it together. Um, well, of course, thinking in terms of consumers and cities <coughs> in a rapidly changing world is also a challenge because we're working here with new technology, which is quickly uh, developing around us. Um, but I would say in the end, it, it's a long term commitment to innovate, which I, in the end is a key to the success of this uh, particular uh, program. I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention and I'd like to give the word now to, uh, to Bahar to uh, uh, facilitate any questions. Thanks uh, to Eduardo, Sebe and also Volker. Um, I think it was a lot of good information and a lot of good real experiences about uh, joint procurement, the benefits and also uh, the challenges that you can gain uh, through sort of shaping a joint procurement together. Um, I think now is uh, more time for discussion and asking questions uh, to the audience uh, and also the people who were listening to us. So feel free to raise your hand or write your questions in your uh, chat box. Uh, then, and then Ms. Pia uh, will help us to um, sort of read your questions and uh, we will ask our uh, presenters to ask. If anybody has a question, uh, feel free to write it in the chat box or raise your hand and then you can, um, we will unmute you so you can raise your question directly to the speaker. So it's uh, Pia here speaking as an uh, organizer. Uh, we have one question here. So who were the procurers who procured jointly in the second presented case? So I think the the question is referring to um, Volker's presentation. What were the benefits from the procuring together? Uh, 
so Volker, if you would like to um, uh, say something. I think you are still muted. Is it muted by the organizer? Okay, and now it should be okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, you can hear. Um, what were the benefits for working together? Well, um, here in, in Holland, we had a situation that the traffic light market is quite closed and that at every individual uh, authority um, had the negative consequences of that. Is, is it okay? Can you hear me? And um, yes. had the negative consequences of that. And by working together, you, you basically make a bigger pie in your tendering procedure. So as I told you, uh, we had over 1000 traffic lights put in the tender procedure. So in that case, you get more interest out of the, of the marketplace. Uh, uh, first of all, and secondly, um, the private companies are uh, willing to uh, invest more money upfront into the actual innovation uh, which we uh, want to uh, achieve because their business case is better and they have the guarantee that at least uh, they will receive a part of, uh, um, of, the, of the work. So that's for me the, the main reason for working together. Uh, I think we don't have, well, maybe one more question. So I will invite Eshan. You should be able to talk now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, I was more eager to hear more of challenges in all these experiences because basically uh, about all of uh, uh, about this issue, uh, maybe everyone agreed that okay, it's uh, nice to have joint procurement, but I didn't hear so much about the challenges because if uh, we want to do the same or we want to follow and have the same. Uh, ex experiences in future. What are the challenges? Uh, I think that's nice if it, if uh, you can give us these challenges then I know that it's not possible to have it in this time but it can be also documented uh, documented and be used uh, afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Volkert think... Bloombergen here. Um, thanks for asking the question, and I think we could agree upon uh, sharing that <coughs> particular question uh, in the information which we uh, sent afterwards. If I can add uh, to also my experiences about uh, joint procurement, uh, I think you raised a very good question. Um, in fact, it's not always uh, so positive or necessarily everything. Everything has like some challenges and some benefits. Um, but in uh, some cases, we have been experiencing that some of the biggest challenges is that um, those who join for joint procurement are not necessarily in the same stage. Uh, meaning that sometimes there are bigger players and some smaller players joining together to do a common procurement. And this sometimes has created issues uh, in a number of projects we, we have been collecting information from that. Um, it actually uh, ended up that some level of work has been done together, like specification normally, which was a very good win-win situation because the smaller partners were able to uh, sort of join to the bigger player and use their experiences, but it didn't necessarily end up that uh, all of them procure together. And also in terms of the cross-border procurement, which has been quite focused recently that um, because of the standardization of the various ITS and also mobility services, electrical vehicle regulations, uh, cross-border procurement and also cross-border joint procurement is getting a lot of focus from commission. Um, but uh, what we have been also heard in terms of the challenges 
uh, of this type of procurement was the different regulations across the countries. Um, for instance, uh, it was uh, quite a difficult situation to uh, do the all technical specifications in the same way and also the criteria for selection of the um, bidders and also the winners was quite difficult uh, and different across the countries. Um, even if everybody is sort of under the European directive and so on, but it was quite um, still localized in some extent that uh, they have found it very difficult sometimes to, uh, to do the final procurement together. But what we have been also analyzing in, in the Common Buyer Group uh, context uh, within the SMICE project, we have looked at uh, more than 12 different models uh, of common procurement, which is available in the uh, website of the SPICE project. Uh, if you just uh, look at the SPICE uh, slash EU uh, in, in the internet, uh, you can actually reach this information. And I think after the webinar, uh, while we send you all the materials and also the broadcast, um, you could also um, use the link to the website and see the other materials. But it is actually, as you mentioned, a very, very important point that where it, it makes much more sense to join a common procurement and create a common procurement and also uh, which type of model fits best to, to the solutions or to the project that you're going to procure. Um, this is something that we really try to work hard on it and the work package for our advice. We hope that uh, we could end up with some good uh, results that everybody can take up and at least we can facilitate a little bit in this, uh, in this procedure. Thanks a lot. I just wanted to give a, a quick uh, reply to that question as well from the uh, FC, uh, FC, uh, FCD uh, procurement process. The biggest challenge we actually had was in the end once we had procured the floating car data was to define the pricing models for our partners. So we have these 19 road authorities, which are all enthusiastic to start using floating car data, but exactly who was going to pay for what part of the, of the procurement process was, was quite a challenge in the end. And we, had to, we, we took quite a while to find the right pricing model to see uh, who was going to pay for what. So that was something which was quite challenging. So I think time is really uh, close to the end. Uh, so if there is no more questions, I would like to thank all of you uh, for joining and uh, putting your time to listen to this webinar. All the information uh, regarding the presentations and the broadcast will be shared with you uh, very shortly after. And please feel free to write to us and also um, in case you have questions or you are interested in joining our common procurement uh, stakeholder group. We are very much uh, willing and welcoming you. Uh, just drop us an email and we will continue the discussion separately. Thank you so much.